uh, we have uh, Austin Branch. He is a faculty in the Applied Research Laboratory for Intelligence and Security, but lives in, in Bluffton, South Carolina. So a friend, a friend of the state, as well as a supporter of Arliss. We have uh, retired Vice Admiral Paul Gaffney, who lives in the Vista, who is on the uh, board of directors of Arliss. So we have a lot of folks, I think, in the, in the, in the COVID world who know each other or have emailed each other a lot. But the purpose of this meeting was to, for the university to learn more about Insure and Arliss because we're a new member of the consortium. We have one project uh, going uh, in the Department of Computer Science and are, of course, looking for more, but also to bring together faculty and then our uh, people from our federal facilities to find out uh, how we can build big programs. So with that, I'll turn it over to Aaron and we'll pick up there. And uh, welcome, Aaron. Thanks so much for coming. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thank you for inviting me and having me here. So uh, as uh, thank you for the introduction. And uh, I am here to, today to talk about uh, the Applied Research Laboratory for Intelligence and Security, or ARLIS, uh, which is a university affiliated research center uh, based at University of Maryland. I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, shortly. Uh, the Insure Consortium uh, that I'm running and that uh, that South Carolina joined uh, the past fall, and in general about the mission space of what we're trying to do and, and who we're working with. So um, I'll give a, a quick introduction to myself. Uh, I uh, worked, trained as an electrical engineer and uh, found myself at the Pentagon running their social science program for a number of years, the Minerva Research Initiative. Uh, which is, uh, if you're not familiar with it, um, really just a, a fantastic program that touches on kind of the intersection of, of humans and security broadly. Um, I found myself at the University of Maryland uh, uh, with the Vice President for Research's office, trying to get researchers across that institution to pivot their work towards areas that were in their work, their area of interest, but also of of interest to the government and connected with uh, government needs. Uh, it's a good way to find money and a good way to also have your work uh, be, be valued. And uh, while I was there, uh, Arliss, uh, University of Maryland had a, uh, a UR previously that was focused on language. Um, we, were, we had a new sponsor and we're trying to identify what this was going to be. And, uh, and so I found myself at Arliss and uh, quit the other job and, and focus on this full time. Okay, so uh, many of you may know what a university affiliated research center or UARC is, but I like to sort of uh, give this at the top. So uh, UARC, there are uh, 14 or 15, depending on how you count them, uh, UARCs around the country. Um, and these are all long-term resources for the Department of Defense. Most are specifically affiliated with one of the military services, with the Army or the Navy. Um, and our list is specifically, uh, our core sponsor is the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence and Security, which really gives us purview across the, the intelligence and security enterprise and across uh, the department at large. But every UARC has a set of core capabilities, core competencies that are unique among the, the UARCs, and it's meant to be a long-term resource and a unique government partner uh, for, for the government to build up uh, and maintain long-term uh, science and technology expertise. So, so at uh, Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory, you know, they have a lot of undersea, well, actually Penn State has more of the undersea warfare, but there's, there's uh, different areas that are considered to be important long-term. And we focus on the human domain. So understanding um, the human social systems, uh, AI autonomy augmentation and how that fits in with the intersection of, of workflows and people. And uh, then looking at data computation and again, um, in service to uh, understanding the, the intersection, building socio-technical solutions for hard security and intelligence problems. Uh, we have the ability to work as a trusted agent. That might, that might mean that we, so we do a lot of work for DARPA, but we don't do very much work for DARPA building new tools. We spend a lot more time working for DARPA to help evaluate the tools that others are building for them and understanding, you know, see how we can break them, see how we how robust they are and whether or not they're really doing what's going to be of value for uh, for 
the enterprise uh, long term. Um, we do not do very much with industry for that reason. We don't want to ever uh, uh, be seen as beholden to industry or having you know, a particularly close partnership with a Lockheed Martin or others. Uh, we value and want to maintain our independence. Uh, so we're really a, a semi-autonomous part of the University of Maryland. So our mission for goals, I already mentioned, core competencies and trusted agents. Uh, the, the Venn diagram, you know, I think is, is a, it reflects the fact that none of this work is really done in a vacuum and most of our teams are, or most of our projects are supported by teams of people from a range of disciplines. Uh, we apply our work primarily these are some areas and mission areas uh, or problem spaces for the intelligence and security communities that we support. So information influence, uh, countering malign influence, disinformation is uh, certainly a space insider threat. Understanding socio-technical systems like supply chains um, and understanding where sort of, uh, you know, how to understand the entire network of the supply chain and where are their, their risks. Um, we were, we started out as a advanced uh, language center and we have capabilities. Uh, I don't even know how many languages, but I should insert a map in here. Uh, so we have both linguistic and language expertise and uh, networks and the ability to build data resources and to help to augment if you want to understand other parts of the world. It helps if you both know what they're saying and ideally know a little bit about the culture to interpret what they're doing. Um, so we're the only, if I showed you a list of all the UARCs, most of them are, you know, pretty, pretty fundamental uh, physical, uh, physical science types of uh, focus areas. We are the only UR core competency, competency in human systems, and, um, and we're also the only UR that really focuses on the intelligence community, which is not to say that others don't support, but this is, you know, sort of definitional for us identifying what our priorities are. Um, and then, of course, we, we manage this Ensure Consortium that I'm going to talk to you about, and this is a new model for UARCs. There's one other UARC that has a consortium, a sort of network of universities that it farms work out to. But it's a different model for a number of reasons. Um, I'll talk about Ensure, but we see this as really a, you know, it's it's expanding our toolbox and leveraging the talent that's all around the country rather than those we can attract to, to move to College Park. So um, I need to update some of this. But so 90% uh, per personnel growth in uh, 2021, it we doubled in size in uh, 2020. So altogether, we've about tripled in size since the beginning of uh, the pandemic which is a lot. Um, and a lot of those people work, you know, on site in College Park. Others uh, like, uh, like Austin um, come in, um, you know, when needed and do a lot of work remotely. We have 80-ish uh, uh, scientists and engineers. Uh, we have a number of affiliates and associates at other universities and uh, within College Park itself that uh, work closely in projects. Um, 15 member institutions in 13 states I'll touch on. Uh, the RISC summer students, the, um, the Research for Intelligence and Security Challenges internship I'll mention uh, ahead and, um, and going across disciplines and colleges and the rest. So here is uh, the, the map of the current 15 members of the Insure Consortium. Um, if you're if you at Arkansas, you can walk across the country or we'll, we'll find a, a pathway. But these are all institutions that were brought on because they had the right ex, you know, expertise that was relevant for our mission and that we felt either extended or added, um, you know, added depth, added bench uh, to the work that we were doing. Uh, these are all institutions that have some history and um, record of supporting applied research, which doesn't mean all academics at these institutions want to do applied research, but that there's, um, you know, that there's some culture that supports doing more quick turn, uh, quick studies that be more applied. Um, there's a cross section here of you know R1 institutions and institutions that you know you you hear about a lot. You know, Texas A and M has obviously a huge research program. Uh, Illinois, others, but we also have institutions like uh, St. Louis University. Uh, which is an R2 institution that's building up. And also we have a number of historically black uh, universities, uh, Morgan State, uh, Howard, UDC. Texas A&M is actually a Spanish serving institutions, but we consider it important that we are tapping 
a broader set of the pipeline and bringing them into um, security relevant research um, than what would be otherwise. The goal of our of insure broadly is when we have you know we don't want to we can't continue tripling in size um but we want to be responsive to any project or you know to the, the problems that come to us that are in scope so um so the joy's law well joy sun microsystems is that uh no matter who you are most of the smart people are going to work somewhere else and so we want to build a natural resource uh, of of uh, like-minded, but uh, researchers who have strengths, who understand the mission uh, space, who understand and are uh, willing to embrace applied research, and that can help expand the impact that our list has at UARC for um, our state global communities. So uh, when someone comes to us, we want to put together not just the team of the researchers available, which tends to be you know, the way of academia, uh, but the right team. The, the team that has the right expertise for the problem. Uh, we have the ability because we are so close in the intersection of university and uh, and government to be to help be a liaison in both directions. Uh, there are a lot of parts of the government that don't release RFPs or BAAs that don't really have a clean mechanism for engaging with the academic community and aren't really sure what they can do for them anyway. And so we work to help uh, translate those messages and then also you know at universities when there's work that could be relevant to you know the national center for credibility assessment but hadn't heard of them before we can, can be a connective tissue for in that direction also and then the building robust uh, diverse uh, workforce uh, some of our work is classified most of it really isn't um, but we want to be able to understand the context of the problems that we're supporting um, but uh, being able to uh, to have that context and work in that space obviously has value. But in general, and, you know, we have we have a lot of talent here with strengths in different areas, and are really glad to have South Carolina as part of the um, the the larger network and picture. I've already talked through a lot of this. Um, something important, you know, the institutional leadership uh, engagements. Uh, so, in fact, you know, Dr. Matthews and and other support that we've had, um, we consider this important for building programs that aren't just, uh, you know, focused on a single PI, but that really can build uh, long-term programs that can be robust and sustained uh, for the future. So that's something that, that's been important uh, for us. And I've talked about a lot of these, the existing uh, partnerships, um, again, South Carolina, just uh, proximity to Fort Jackson, to uh, the, um, Charleston and you know, Newark and others that are, you know, there's a lot of partnerships here that we want to better understand the mission space in those uh, for those agencies as well, so that we can be more supportive um, in the research that we're doing. Uh, number of pro so projects all have to be within scope of ARLIS, uh, which makes sense, and it should be a, the character of what a, a UARC does. Um, and every project, uh, a number of our projects, you know, are almost wholly conducted at Texas A&M or at George Mason or at other institutions, but everything, every project has an ARLIS lead that helps connect it to the larger portfolio of what we're trying to do. Um, and then pathways to funding, sometimes we have schools who are already having their own connections and say, hey, we have, you know, this group that wants to fund us, can we do it through Insure? Sometimes uh, there's our list work that we're out um, trying to make connections to stakeholders. They tell us that they want something broadly and, and we either don't have all of the right expertise or maybe we don't have enough of it because our folks are pretty stretched. So we want to be able to bring others into those projects. And then uh, you know the third topic that we're starting to build more is building a reputation where agencies are just coming to us and saying, here's, here's our problem. Can you reach out to, you know, the academic network and try to bring us so, um, some solutions? So, uh, and a lot of this is, you know, so this gives some of the sponsors of the, the current work um, and, and milestones. I think, you know, part of what we bring in, you know, there's, there's always process issues in, in all of these partnerships, but we, uh, we have people and, you know, our streamlining processes to try to get all of that working. Um, but this is, I think, more important in terms of what are some of the projects that we care most about. I mentioned a little bit about supporting the, you know, being kind of a government partner 
um, from the science and technology piece of independent test and evaluation, verification and validation, um, really across uh, across a wide range of projects. Uh, these are this is a capability that we are looking to provide uh, data infrastructure. Um, you know, in general, in part of our mission space is global sense making. There's so much data, so much information out there that, but yet it's hard to find answers to specific questions. And we are looking to support the government with this. And by doing this, uh, you know, being uh, kind of a, a demilitarized, uh, you know, a safe space of, uh, of data from, from other government programs, from work that we've done for, from other uh, you know, industry partners, where we can you know, be kind of the consumer reports that you know someone builds a tool and we'll have the data, the real data to try to test and see how how it works um, or to find the, the right answers. Most of our work is not basic research, so there's this six one uh, terminology here, uh, but we do do some basic research. Um, but most of our work has you know harder deliverables and timelines um, that align with the fact that we're largely supporting really operational uh, parts of the government. This is uh, some, uh, a subset of some of the projects that are currently in the portfolio. So the takeaways here, you can see you know, the technical lead coming from different institutions, but having our list lead here. Um, you know, these align broadly to, uh, to some of our portfolios uh, that we have already, um, but there's, the alignment uh, can be flexible and sometimes the, the economic statecraft project, for example, uh, this was a project the Air Force came to us and was interested in better understanding the economic levers of power, how others are using them and how we can use them better. And, um, you know, that's in the, the space of understanding humans technology and information, certainly it's of interest to the intelligence community. It's not an area that we had a lot of in house expertise, but the Bush School at Texas A&M did. So, uh, you know, working in partnership with them, we now have, uh, you know, a new capability and a new uh, connection to, re to experts in this area. So when other economic questions come, um, then we can, uh, we have the right people we can go to quickly to turn around uh, responses. This is a few things that are kind of on the horizon that uh, are you know, some of the big hairy wicked problems that the country is dealing with right now that our, our, you know, that our stakeholders are caring about and that we think this national resource network of insure might help to bootstrap responses on. So this first is you know, the detection and counting of malign influence or countering like that on the slide. Um, so you know, there's a lot of research happening, you know, especially over the last you know seven years or so on disinformation, misinformation, and understanding how influence kind of works. Um, and you know we've we've learned some things, but the nation still doesn't have a cohesive picture of both who's doing what research, how can we pull it together, where are the the larger gaps, and in general, what what are the thrusts that need to be prioritized to be able to respond in a um, you know, an effective way. So having the network that we, you know, starting up with the insurance network and uh, working with our sponsorship, which already cares a lot about this problem, uh, Arliss and Insure are looking to become kind of the, you know, the, the ringleaders was popping in my head, you know, so to lead the pack in order to add a little bit of structure, directionality and, um, and integration uh, for this wide range of work that's already happening. Um, so interested in hearing about work that's relevant to that. This is a similar thing for national sense making. Um, so the White House and others have come to us wanting to be able to better uh, garner answers from large ranges of information uh, and often information that they can't look at very easily or certainly the intelligence community um, can't in terms of for most of the intelligence community, uh, there are a lot of restrictions for good reason about looking at domestic populations. Um, but it's hard to understand a competitive analysis of how we're doing against Russia in area X if our folks can't look at what we're doing. So, uh, so by being you know, in this in-between space and being able to be a convener of different experts, we feel that there's, there's uh, some impact that we can have here. In general, and this is you know, 
I give to, to faculty, you know, applied work is different in a lot of different ways. Um, some, uh, there are reasons people don't want to do very applied work. Uh, it's hard to support a three year grad students when, you know, a lot of the projects are 12 month projects. Uh, a lot of the projects have citizenship uh, limitations or, you know, you can publish on them, but you have to have some sort of security review before you publish just because you maybe had access to sensitive information and, and there's sensitivities to that, uh, which is all understandable. Um, at the same time, you know, I think, and this is something I've found, you know, throughout my career when I was at the Defense Department trying to pull in social scientists or at uh, the University of Maryland trying to get researchers to focus a little more mission oriented. People want their research to have impact. They want to make a difference and especially to problems they consider important. Uh, the scale, uh, you know, so the project dollar signs are often bigger, which can enable uh, new work to happen. But just the uh, ability to have more direct impact. Um, working with organizations that otherwise uh, don't typically work to, with universities and likewise i think you know most many researchers feel they have a close relationship with their nsf program manager for example it's a very different thing to actually have a close relationship with an operational office in the intelligence community or, or larger security community who knows what you can do you understand what they need and uh, be able to build partnerships from there. So something that's uh, offered. And there's a lot of reasons that the, the government likes to work with us also. I think just being a clearing house and trying to be the, the connective tissue um, from the, the university side uh, has value. Streamlined co contracting and being able to do sole source contracting um, obviously helps to facilitate quick turn studies uh, in a way that uh, competitive, uh, you know, competitions can uh, can limit, and uh, you know we have the ability to provide uh, controlled environments for for uh, university researchers to work on, which not every university has the in-house capability to to support Takeuwe networks. Um, so jumping to uh, the the risk program, um, which is has re relationships. So this is our internship program. Um, you know, overall, this is real projects for real end users. This year, we have 103 students who are working virtually uh, in teams of two to four uh, on projects that are were directly requested by the government. So, you know, there's an actual government sponsor at the other end who can help course correct in the midst of the the 10 week program. So the students are learning. You know, they're learning new skills. They're learning. You know, you know, building new disciplinary expertise, but applied towards a, a real problem, uh, which again adds adds excitement uh, for a lot of folks. So um, we started this program up in 2020. It wasn't meant to be virtual, and uh, it turned out that that was a, a good model for what we needed to do. And so we've uh, built on and, and augmented. Um, I gave a lot of this uh, information already, but I wanted to highlight that of the uh, the students. Um, we we focus a lot on the insure institutions, uh, the insure membership again to help recruit students into the internship. To recruit, uh, every team of two to four works with a faculty mentor who helps provide technical guidance. They say like going from a problem into a project. It's one thing to know what the government needs, and another thing to turn it into something you can do in ten weeks and know what your your uh, takeaways are. Um, and we had a good representation from University of South Carolina in terms of student applicants, and we have one of our technical mentors uh, from uh, South Carolina also. And um, so this is, uh, we started with, with about 15 students in 2020, and then uh, I think 38 in 2021 and 103 this year, and uh, I need to stop uh, accomplishing the goals that are being set because they keep setting the goals higher. So we're talking about 200 or 300 in the years ahead. But I think in general, this is both a, a, a value add for the government and for, I think, uh, university researchers across the country who wouldn't necessarily think of working for on security problems or for the Defense Department normally. It's not accessible. It's, you know, far away. They don't have any um, any sort of comparative uh, thought of what they could do with their skill set for this space and uh, already just with two years past and on year three we have a good record of bringing students into government hires or working in the the larger um, enterprise and uh, in general just making them uh, more understanding of the problem space that's there 
So, okay, that was about half an hour that we thought uh, discussion. So uh, that's a, an overview of a lot of what we care about and what we do. Um, you know, my mission coming here is, first of all, it's just always different actually getting to meet people in person and talking and interacting. Uh, I want to better understand, you know, South Carolina is now in our toolbox. What does that mean? And what, who are the researchers that are here and what might they be interested in contributing um, and how, that, how they might partner? Um, you know, it's one thing to know that you have a number of experts in the AI space, that could mean a lot of different things. So, so really uh, being able to have some conversations and understanding where the strengths and priorities are, I think will help us build more effective partnerships with you. So uh, there's a little bit of time for questions. I can take some. Question two, high level question. Can I keep your slides and use those as I, as I talk with people or I'll talk to people? It, it's a good reminder of the yeah. things. Yeah, I should, uh, I should add a, you know, not officially endorsed by the government uh, uh, okay. tag on it, but yeah. Uh, otherwise, yeah. Yeah. Personally, I don't like to email this all over because who knows, but I'd like to be able to show it. Yeah. And get some reminders, you know, like yeah. I think that you emphasize there. The supply of research is different than it's that great. People will right. respond to that as, as they can. Mm -hmm. so that's a good point. And of course, you know, we've got a, a a little bit of a cross section today to show you yeah. what we got, what we thought might be very relevant, and other things we'll find yeah. out during the day. So, as we talk with other folks mm -hmm. on the campus, we'll be able to. Any questions, comments? I was wondering about uh, indirect cost overhead. Mm -hmm. Do you think the, the money is coming from somebody? It's mm -hmm. coming regardless. You have some overhead advantages, and then you send it down to Carl to do some work for you. Mm -hmm. uh, is there overhead in there, or is it there is correct? So, um, so the work comes into Arliss and University of Maryland as a prime, and then the <clears throat> subcontract goes to um, our membership, uh, allows us to utilize the vehicle. Uh, in terms of facilities and administration, that's the um, cost. Uh, like any uh, subcontract, only the first twenty-five thousand dollars, I think, that we charge uh, University of Maryland FNA, um, any FNA that's at the university. We also have uh, a an eight percent UR consortium fee that is both goes to helping to run things broadly, but also IRAD internal funds um, to, to have competition to build partnerships across institutions and, and which we will be building up. So, um, so we try to keep it as streamlined as possible. We don't want it to be a deterrent, but we also want to be able to build the enterprise. But the money that comes eventually to a partner university has mm -hmm. overhead <laughs> built into it, so they can take their overhead. Yeah. And we put our institutional yeah. overhead rate on, on, yeah. our, on our portion of the work. Yeah. Or you may, it may be useful to also note that uh, we, and you already did this on the slide, that we do have this unique relationship with the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence and Security. Mm -hmm. We have a we have an IDIQ right. that's there. So if, uh, so, so for example, there was a you know federal government and I'm across government, not just Department of Defense, came to you guys and said, "Hey, we have a requirement. We think you guys can. There is a there's a pathway to ensure that uh, IDIQ be able to get to uh, mm -hmm. to get to as long as it's within scope and the scope is consistent with with what Aaron just all laid out. So. We have others who utilize that, mm -hmm. even government, our own uh, services you know, will use that vehicle to not only get to us, but to get others yeah. to connect. Absolutely. And we do have a, a second vehicle right now also with the intelligence community, which has been uh, those outside of the DOD part of the intelligence community have had trouble using the DOD mechanism. So having additional vehicles always helps make things happen. But, um, but yeah, it, it helps to uh, tremendously speed up the process essentially once, uh, once the researchers and the, the group with the requirements have figured out what it is that they want to focus on here. Thanks, I look forward to learning more about your So um, Carl, let's just get you up next. So, so swapping over the slide. Thank you. Well, good morning. Uh, it's nice to be here with you. My name is Carl Dahlman. Uh, as, uh, as Mike mentioned, I've come back to the University of South Carolina. 
I made the mistake of leaving 16 years ago and uh, <laughs> have the opportunity to come back. Uh, I was at Miami University, uh, ran a large interdisciplinary uh, international studies or global studies program there. Uh, I'm a political geographer by training, uh, but my background is more interdisciplinary than that. Uh, I started life in computer science uh, in the late 1980s. Um, then I wanted to be an ethnomusicologist. I ended up in sociology and music, mm -hmm. a degree in urban affairs and social protests. And then I realized the most interesting things in the world were in the geography department. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a path that makes sense to me. Um, and as Mike said, uh, I have just uh, moved back to town. I'm not quite sure where my suit and tie are. I promise I'll have one next time. So let me tell you a little bit about the Walker Institute. I think it's important for a number of us here. Um, it's gone through a lot of changes. There's been a lot of transition. And so I think even for um, on-campus folks, this is gonna be new information. I also wanna explain uh, how important uh, our new role as a curricular unit is going to be in, in what we do. Part of that plays into workforce development and internship opportunities, but it also has a lot to do with the fact that as an interdisciplinary institute, we own very little faculty labor. We do it on goodwill, exchange, coercion, guilt, lots of reasons why we get people involved in it, mostly goodwill. Um, so when we bring people in for the research component of it, we're always balancing this with our other interests. The Institute was founded, the full name is for International Area Studies. It was founded in 1961 by uh, Professor uh, Richard Walker, um, who among other things was uh, Reagan's ambassador to South Korea. At the time it was the uh, Institute for International Studies and was housed within what was then the Government and uh, International Studies Department, which is now the uh, Department of Political Science. Um, it has long had programming uh, uh, activities and responsibility for research, support of graduate fellowships, uh, broadly in the area of, of international studies, um, often focused in political science. And um, this, this was a mission that I think was starting to run farther away from the interdisciplinary needs of the campus. At about the same time, um, there was the development of, of two other degrees, a global studies degree, a truly interdisciplinary degree, and, uh, and most recently, uh, really just last year, a cyber intelligence degree, as well as six uh, fairly traditional area studies units, so African studies, Asian studies, Latin American studies, and so on. So in, in, uh, in 2021, uh, Dean Samuels reorganized uh, the Walker Institute, took it out of uh, political science formally, um, and ran um, a search for a new director. Uh, we had a year of uh, interim director, Josh Grace, who did a fantastic job of, uh, he was not a caretaker, uh, like Boris Johnson says he will be. He was an active um, interim and started to move a lot of pieces forward, which I really appreciate. So um, I was the choice for continuing director and, uh, and I'm here. Uh, as of uh, July 1. So um, the missions and goals, as most recently stated for Walker Institute, um, are fairly broad, support international teaching, research, and public affairs programming to help students and faculty see the world through a global lens. Now, we have since added these, these curricular components to the Institute, especially the cyber degree that's not, I think, fully reflected in this mission. It's one of the revisions that we'll be working on in the coming months. Our goal is to uh, do, I think, include all of this, to stimulate discussion and awareness of international issues at the USC campus, to encourage our students and faculty to engage in international travel and research, to promote interdisciplinary research and scholarship on international topics, and to serve as a community resource on international issues. Our areas of responsibility are fairly broad in this uh, reorganized institute. The curricular piece, which is new for us, um, and where I think I'll be spending a lot of my bandwidth for the next couple of years, are to bring together and, uh, and to, to fully staff and organize a BA in Global Studies, our three-year average uh, for majors and enrollments is about 116. Um, COVID gave us a bit of a dent. I think we can build up um, to well over, my goal is 200 for that. Uh, we have a BS in cyber intelligence, which we are um, proposing to rename cyber intelligence, ethics, and policy. I'll explain that here in a moment. Um, that's been going for one year. We already have 37 majors. We have a lot of incoming student interest. I expect that that's going to show a lot of robust growth. The area studies minors that I mentioned before, the six of them, uh, and we have a number of scholarships and fellowships, some, um, some medium-sized endowments that allow us to support uh, students as well as faculty. Um, we've also been given in the near term this ROTC reporting responsibility, which uh, Ms. Jody Salter 
is heading up. Um, we're not sure where that's going to land. There's some discussion about where that should be in the college. Um, I can tell you that the campus commanders have everything under control and I don't think they need me for anything, but I'm officially, if um, I guess they, they need a backstop. Um, in terms of research, uh, we've long supported and will continue to support uh, conferences uh, in this area. Um, re small research grants to faculty, uh, international travel support. I'm building in, um, and I have a director's fund from the Dean uh, to start what I'm calling a Walker Fellows thematic program, identifying groups of faculty across not only our college, but the campus who have some shared interests, bringing them together in a year long fellowship program with some undergraduate students and funding to support them in not just a reading group, but to uh, share ideas across, and we're interdisciplinary, so sharing ideas across the, uh, the disciplines, looking for opportunities for new research would be one of the outcomes of this, as well as campus programming guest speakers and conferences to help uh, inform new areas of research on our campus. Um, and I'm all, I will also be building out um, research work group development, uh, less with uh, so that Walker Fellows also has a curricular undergraduate and graduate facing component, but smaller research group development is possible, seed funds, bringing teams together. I think this might be um, a perfect vehicle for identifying new opportunities to work uh, with Ensure. Um, we also have a long tradition of community outreach and partnerships that's very important to us, to campus and to the state. Um, public lectures that we run on campus, the Palmetto Forum and our connection with uh, the Columbia, uh, I got it backwards, Jody, sorry, uh, the Columbia World Affairs Council. Uh, these are all things that Jody knows more about. So if you have questions, I'm going to defer to her. Um, cyber related conferences um, that we've had in the past, I'll tell you more about that. And teacher development, I want to work more in that space. I think it's incredibly important in South Carolina. I know this from when I was here before, right after 9 11, the number of questions that our K through 12 teachers had about what's going on in the world and how to explain complicated topics um, in the classroom is more important than ever. And I see us continuing in that tradition. Um, just to go back to the curricular component for a moment, because it also reflects, I think, some of what our faculty interest is. As I said, we are only as strong as the faculty that choose to participate with us. Um, our, our global studies degree has students focusing on a wide array of topics. It's not a potpourri major where you can just kind of throw in anything international there there is some logic to it um, some of the themes that students can choose are such things as global development and sustainability uh, this brings together environmental and economic questions with human communities global health um, global conflict and security uh, a popular choice and uh, global cultures which can include everything from you know anthropology classes migration classes sociology and so on Students also need to focus some classes on one of the major world regions. So they need to know something about regional context and where things actually happen uh, and why they're different from North America. So that's the six. Um, and then we also require several years of foreign language training, which is one of the hallmarks of a good global studies program. So it's actually quite rigorous in a lot of ways. If I, if I could add something overnight, it would be several hours in economics, um, maybe six or nine hours in economics, but we're not there yet. Um, the cyber intelligence degree, um, is really interesting in the way that it's been brought together. And there are classes focused on digital data analysis, as well as specific analytical tools, a lot of them, especially in um, our geography department, which has a longstanding strength in geographic information systems, remote sensing, and so on. Alongside coursework, so students are taking you know, these math and data and uh, tools classes alongside, of course, uh, courses in policy and law, ethics, psychology, um, domestic and global uh, cyber issues. And what uh, I intend to build out is uh, the sort of balance point between the kind of tools and technology world and the law policy ethics and society world uh, is really a focus on, on policy. What is, it, um, what is it where these two worlds meet and how choices are made? What are the problems? How do we resolve them? What are the social changes that are coming about as a result? What's the right uh, fulcrum? For this kind of change, it's not always government, sometimes it's community action, sometimes it's corporate. This is a good way to bring students into a conversation where they see the world not as a series of challenges they can't solve, but ones that they can. So just to uh, give you a sense of our faculty and staff, um, I'm keeping Josh on as associate director for a semester, uh, then I'm searching for a new one. We've got our six area studies directors. Um, we've just hired an instructor. So I do, I do own one faculty member, glad to have Dr. Austin Crane coming on board, he'll be teaching four and four. Um, 
We need few of those actually, I think, to cover our intro courses that we're gonna build out. Um, in external relations, we have Jody, um, for whom I'm very grateful for what she has already built and brought to the table. We have a business manager, graduate fellows and undergraduate. I think what's really interesting is that our institute faculty at last count is 161. And it's uh, not quite 50-50, but they're not all in CAS. 89 in CAS, 72 outside of CAS. And I, we ran down the list of, uh, and, and this is more than one, except I think university libraries may be just one person. All the others have multiple faculty members who have contacted the Institute to say, we have an interest in this area. We wanna be involved. We wanna to talk to you about this. As a result, we've got a very wide remit. Uh, I was running through our list of faculty to try to get a sense of, of capacity. Um, and I see methods in statistical, spatial statistical techniques, especially in GIS and remote sensing, but also social network analysis. Um, studies on social influence, affective behavior analysis. In fact, we've um, our psychology department uh, has just hired uh, someone who specializes in cyber psychology, who will be teaching a specific course uh, in our degree. So we're glad to see that. Um, we have specialists in policy and legal analysis, uh, folks who study cultural patterns, not only material cultural patterns, but also uh, linguistic changes and metaphysical religious practices and beliefs, philosophy courses, ethics, foreign language uh, skills as well. And we have practical fields and applications such as health and medicine, elections and public influence, um, uh, economic and community development, environmental change, and human dimensions of environmental change, political economic practices, migration analysis. And that's just what I've been able to identify in the few days that I've been here. So as I get to know the faculty, we'll be able to better inventory what the capacities are and what kind of teams we can bring together. So I wanna focus more specifically on cyber at Walker and talk a little bit about how this has come together. Um, Walker's really benefited from some early efforts in bringing cyber to campus and not just cyber technologies, but cyber and society, if I can make that distinction. Um, again, this is an area where, where Jody has uh, had a lot of involvement in working with partners across campus, identifying opportunities that, that we're not always aware, I think, to folks in Walker. Um, one of them is the DOD Cyber Workshop, uh, which was really, uh, if I can phrase it this way, was really focused on workforce development and what opportunities um, uh, were out there and what, what specifically the University of South Carolina needed to be thinking about in preparing students to work with any of these different stakeholders, corporate, government, military, security, and so on. Um, <clears throat> that, was, uh, that was October 2021, so this is all fairly recent, and um, this really brought a public spotlight to cyber at the Walker Institute. Uh, the workshop was attended by a number of key figures, including Governor McMaster, Lieutenant General Kroll from the Joint Staff C4 Cyber, Ken Bible from Homeland Security, Mike Clark from US Cybercom, and many more, as well as our own faculty with interests in this area. Uh, the SC Cyber Symposium is an annual collaboration, again, that Jody's been uh, working with the uh, SC Department of Administration for state cybersecurity departments to discuss their best practices. And uh, there was also uh, work with uh, with engineering, but it's actually integrated information here, um, Office of Naval Research uh, with um, Jorge Cuccino and the work that they were doing with ROTC students uh, from a curricular dimension. So these are some of the pieces that have been here already. And um, this is where the cyber degree sort of uh, was kind of born into this test bed, I guess we could say. Our cyber curriculum right now highlights the broad social dimensions of cyber technology. We're also going through a curricular revision um, that highlights more of the broader concepts that foreground ethics and policy. And this comes back to this point. My job as director is to find this balance point between uh, curricular and research interests, but also between some fairly, I would say, pretty broadly different interests that faculty have uh, in cyber technology information. And that balance is one where I think we can generate really healthy conversations between questions of national security, as well as uh, uh, private sector interests with some of the more critical minded, philosophical and ethical questions that academics are allowed to ask and need to ask. And I'd like to see that we can build a space where that research can be conducted independently and also brought together in conversation from time to time. That is the best of what I think um, a campus can offer for these sorts of issues. So this is not a formal SWAT. You might question my, um, uh, uh, strategery on sharing this, but this is a sort of incoming, incoming director's look at what have we got in this area. I really see our strengths in cyber that uh, we were uh, involved early on with these initiatives of bringing stakeholders together. We're seen in the state, 
and I think nationally as having uh, having that uh, initiative. A strong interest among campus and off-campus stakeholders, strong student interest that will generate institutional support, fingers crossed under the RCM model. Our interdisciplinary degree and faculty allow us to support some novel initiatives. Some of the weaknesses are though, is that these are fairly early days as we're reforming the Institute. And so we're still in the early phase of community and capacity building as I get to know the faculty and identify team members and what they might do. And Walker is new at supporting external research. I've been involved with it myself. My research has been supported by a couple of NSF grants. I've been in that kind of space before. That's something we'll have to build out. In terms of opportunities, we can be an incubator, I believe, for assembling new collaborative faculty projects. Uh, we can host broader and more inclusive understanding of cyber, um, perhaps than other venues. Uh, we have off-campus collaboration that will benefit students, including a number of internships. And I, there's robust pathways out of our cyber major that I think these sorts of arrangements can, can help uh, amplify. Some of the threats, though, are insecure funding sources. Uh, there's not a dedicated research fund or endowment. Um, external grants are not guaranteed. Holding faculty attention in this space, of course, is going to have a lot to do with what kind of funding we can bring to it. There are also a lot of different visions for what cyber needs to be on a campus like this. Um, those stakeholders are on campus, they're off campus. As I said, I'm trying to find balance in all of those and bringing them together because I think that's a productive space. But those stakeholder visions, which exceed the university at the state level and beyond, um, we need to make sure that they're all working in sync. And I see that as a large part of my job. Uh, and then this sort of question of imbalanced constituencies, um, you know, the, um, the will may be strong, but the flesh may be weak. We need to make sure that we've got folks who want to work in this space and come out and spend the time on this. You mentioned Stan Dubinsky's project. When I was announced as director, he was the first person to email me and say, hey, I want to tell you about what we're doing. Yeah, sounds like him. And so I'm glad to see that kind of initiative and I'm happy to work with him. Um, uh, as we get there. So, you know, looking ahead, we're graduating our first uh, cyber major uh, this summer. Um, entered as, must have entered as a junior, I guess. He's only been in one year. Is that right? I already had some that already fit there. Um, and so we have a lot that we're still working on in this area, but I'd be happy to take any questions with the minutes that I have left. Thank you. Oh, I actually have a couple comments. Yeah, please. Some feedback and questions. First of all, when I first heard cyber, I thought we narrowly find the technical aspect mm. of cyber because that's the issue of DOD is that mm -hmm. way to find it. But yet you describe an interdisciplinary construct that's more akin to some of the broader issues we're dealing with at the intersection of hard science and soft science. Mm -hmm. uh, and that uh, intersection of cyber electromagnetic space the cognitive security space, mm -hmm. all of that is what you describe mm -hmm. as the guts of the Institute, which makes it a little bit exciting uh, mm -hmm. because it is those types of organizations that I know the folks we're working with across DOD, our services, our combatant commands, and uh, our intelligence community, the ODI has just st stood up from the Launch Influence Response Center, mm -hmm. where uh, we have a uh, meet with USAID, Mm -hmm. Next week, as they mm -hmm. stand up their own, and they're looking for um, mm -hmm. relationships with institutions like ours mm -hmm. to help them build a foundation of, a, of research, applied research, and understanding, test, and evaluation uh, uh, exercises. You know, mm -hmm. being able to host those kind of tabletops and 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 and, uh, and drive that kind of discourse and discussion. So there's a there's an appetite mm -hmm. for what you just described uh, uh, your institute. Is and so, um, but I, I would tell you at first glance, you see cyber, you think I'm mean, technical. Yeah, when you get into the guts of this, it's 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 really the, you're connecting a lot of dots across the university, and so to be able to describe it, describe that um, might be useful because there, there's a whole set of clients who would be interested in that broader set. Um, and that is, uh, that is a vision that's been developing really just with this interim process and this transition. Um, you know, early naming, early branding is important. We don't want to lose it too quickly. So cyber, when we were yeah. cyber intelligence, I said, let's add policy and ethics to begin to expand this. And that, that's, that's a bit of the challenge that we have before us is communicating to our stakeholders and constituencies, all that could go into this area, um, including, uh, I, I believe there's a new course on philosophy uh, in ethics of cyber that they're going to be offering. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, which is a fantastic place for 
yeah, ethical hacking, that's right, uh, for students to be thinking about that, uh, that's, that's more than just how to use the tools. And if I may, yeah, the please. string, uh, I'm trying to hold up all the time because this is, to me, this is where I spend most of my time thinking. Right. I'll tell you right now, uh, our office is working closely with the Naval Information Warfare Center Atlantic on related activities, you know, standing with labs and, and, uh, and efforts to, to uh, there's an applied research to do what you're doing uh, aspect of this to, uh, to inform acquisition, to inform uh, the development of capability <laughs> methods and applications uh, where we want to have this connection to academia, tied to industry, uh, certainly to serve a broader government, but not just U.S. DOD, but broader United States government and mm. our international partners who are mm -hmm. equally interested in these efforts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as I believe, please correct me if I'm wrong, Aaron, a derivative of the, the value proposition of the insure relationship is not only what Aaron outlined, but imagine uh, that some of the key leaders on, like, for example, on the applied side, the Arliss Applied Research, there's a bunch of folks, senior folks who have been involved directly with the mission areas, uh, commanded Army Cyber Command. Uh, you know, next week I'm talking to General Crawl about as he retires to join Arliss that work with us. And uh, we're working with others. We have other senior leaders, uh, Lieutenant General Lori Reynolds, who, who was the Deputy Commandant for Information, at the Marine Corps is already on our team. And myself, some of us spend a lot of time here in South Carolina, I live here, but mm -hmm. we spend a lot of time here. Mm -hmm. Imagine if we were able, as part of the insurer, participate and help in those conferences, talking to students, yeah. engaging, and uh, in supporting curricula that's involved. I believe that's critically important. That's great. It's also important as, as, as this institution, is, as Eric and I have spoken about, is is so geographically well situated when we talk about army cyber command mm -hmm. we talk about our navy front mm -hmm. department of energy mm -hmm. another great partner and and you guys are just in a great spot and um and so i just thought as carl as you develop this the ensure partnership i think would be valuable in that way yeah, absolutely and also be able to help you think through how you evolve the institute in a way that that would uh, really also meet the needs or be a pipeline for students into government or in industry in ways that they may not otherwise have access. That's great. I'm glad to hear those things. And that's exactly what I mean by balancing multiple constituencies. And one of them is how do we connect our curricular obligations to the students to um, career outcomes for them, how to feed them into places where they can go do good work. Um, you know, one of my one of my mantras, I was glad to see it in your slides is um, the system of liberal democracy that we have understood for, you know, 50 plus years is under attack in multiple directions. So how do we how do we safeguard that? How do we build that out? And how do we instill those understandings and values in the curriculum so that students know why they're going to do what they do? I think that will make a better generation of uh, policy folks, technical folks, and so on. Absolutely. Let, let me share this. This is a slightly outdated look at the BS degree program, but it's some information that I think would be useful. Yeah. Oh, real quick. Um, just, um, so I think after today, you can no longer call yourself a new guy. Okay. Um, so, um, old guy, old guy. Yeah. So, um, but I want to make sure, uh, one, I want to get your email address. I want to send you an invite to come down to Charleston in September um, to, to just kind of watch uh, as we execute our cyber ANTX, which is an advanced technology uh, experimentation uh, venue that we open up to industry, commercial industry, non-traditional DOD, academia, to come in and kind of, um, you know, show us what you've got. Um, we had PCDC uh, that you guys came down uh, back in April. Um, Tony Dillon, I believe is on staff here, uh, works with Jorge, uh, you know, uh, we're actually in the process now of investigating a Prada uh, to, to work with the university in you know, taking the high-speed internet to the next level. Um, but sitting down in Charleston, right here in your backyard, you have the highest density of cybersecurity scientists and engineers, as well as uh, data scientists, AI, machine learning, uh, scientists and engineers. Uh, we work with CDAO, 
Um, you know, we're, we're connected to all the other things and we have the largest quarantined RDT network, with, you know, so think cyber blast chambers, you know, where you can come and do experimentation, right, inside a secure network, uh, leveraging our scientists and engineers to do evaluations and help build towards, you know, mission threats, uh, use cases, you know, so that we can actually start taking you know, applied research and actually solving real world problems and, and shortening the gap between a 6.3, let's go from a 6.3 to a 6.7 really quick, right? Just sweep through the valley of death. Um, and that's what my mission is, is to get through that valley of death, get things into the hands of the warfighter. So when you come to the NTX, you're not going to see a bunch of suits. You're going to see uniform Marines and sailors uh, and have the opportunity to talk directly to them to find out, hey, how can I help direct the interface with you to solve your problem, right? So I want to make sure you're connected to that. And we can do that because we have an educational partnership agreement with the University of South Carolina, right? So as you develop these curriculums, please reach out to me. Um, you know, if you need adjunct professors, if you want people to come in and, and give guest lectures on any of these range of topics, um, we're, we're an hour and 45 minutes away. Okay. I'm going to add one more invitation. Uh, Arliss, on behalf of the Office of Secretary of Defense Policy and for Intelligence Security and the Joint Staff, we run the Phoenix Challenge. Phoenix Challenge it is the platform to convene the entire information enterprise in a series of output, outcome based conferences and workshops uh, every quarter. And uh, we restarted all of that in Phoenix. Um, but uh, on behalf of to bring the entire enterprise, that includes academia, our foreign partners, industry, government across the U.S. government. We just had our last one a week ago, uh, a week ago uh, in Charleston. That was Phoenix Challenge 2. But what it does is it gives you a platform to have panels to engage, to present, talk about you in front of a whole host of folks, both in either the classified, unclassified space, and expose what you're doing to folks who would be, I think, very interested, especially uh, interested in your associations with not only Arliss, but the, the whole consortia and then government kinds of things you're already doing. Uh, I'll invite you to participate in that. And um, it's, a, it's a nice platform. The um, next one, by the way, is October in Hawaii, uh, sponsored by uh, Indo-PACOM, uh, Indo focused on that theater. And then after that, we're in London, co-sponsored with the UK and France, with NATO as a focus, and then we keep going the cycle. So this is a broader exposure, but what, what you described is absolutely in the sweet spot of Phoenix, which Phoenix Challenge uh, is designed to support. We actually took an action at the Phoenix Challenge too, that, you know, Mike, I'm gonna, I'm going to recommend that the university engage in the action, uh, which was to take our service uh, academies and, and educational institutions, as well as our national intelligence uh, uh, universities, um, to help mentor, collaborate, and help build out. We have graduate programs uh, within the defense academic and the intelligence, national intelligence academic enterprise. Um, but how are we then communicating those advanced degrees to our private and public universities to build undergraduate programs, which I know you and I spoke previously about creating a, a national intelligence type of an undergraduate program, which I think you know we are seeing is coming into higher demand. So um, you know, it will be great to help connect with you in that endeavor because I think you'll gain insight as to you know what how does that feed into those other higher graduate programs. It's Dean Jones down the circle. Yeah, yeah, so okay. Okay. So we still need to have the South Carolina combat. The uh, 25th of oh, July. We can talk about that at lunch. All right, we'll talk about that at lunch. Yeah. Thanks, Carlos. Hard time getting all four or five of the partners together. We've got one, two, three, three at University Network, NCCA, and a couple more. Well, this is great discussion. I, I, I'm pleased that we did see these connections here. Uh, Carl, would you care to join with Fort Hay and Jody this afternoon to, to see Fort Hay hardware? Yes. I mean, I'll join too. I want to see it. There's a lot to talk about. Well, we, we powered right through that a main 10 minute break, and I would just suggest everybody to see the restroom and water fountain. Take your break if you need to.
Now we're going to delve a little bit more into technology and some projects in technology. So Dr. Amit Sheff, Director of the AI Institute at South Carolina. And by the way, if, if I have to run out, it's because I'm moving my car. <laughs> I can't get my, my parking. Well, uh, delighted to be here. Um, uh, the AI Institute um, started three years ago, uh, and I moved with uh, six of my uh, uh, teammates from Wright State University. Now we have more than 30 people. Uh, we have had uh, tremendous growth. Um, we have um, six core faculty, but a pretty large number of, uh, this is partial list of faculty and or faculty affiliates and research staff, um, and plus a large number of PhD students, uh, graduate students, undergraduates. Um, uh, just a little bit about uh, me, uh, since the um, discussion was about applied nature of uh, the work. Um, I um, have, a co so I'm an entrepreneur, researcher, and educator. So I have founded three and co-founded one companies, three of them by licensing research or technology developed in our own um, largely federally funded research. Um, the last company which is going on now uh, called Cognovi Labs is at the intersection of AI and emotion. And is entirely about the humans uh, and how human decision making uh, using large amount of uh, data, typically social media data, but it can be other data, including news and uh, with other sources. Uh, so understand uh, the role of uh, emotions in human decision making, like purchasing, or why are uh, consumers or patients not renewing their prescription or using prescriptions, and you can clearly see the defense or intelligence um, uh, applications of those kind of thing. Um, before uh, going to launch that company, I had um, um, several years of research funding from uh, National Science Foundation, as well as NIH, as well as DOD. We built a very robust technology. Uh, the technology was used uh, for calling correctly. And that is the only known uh, case that uh, you know, I'm honestly aware of that called uh, US election 2012 correctly, called US election 2016 correctly, called um, uh, Alabama Senate election correctly. This was a very small, you know, less than half a percentage uh, difference, called Brexit correctly well before uh, the Brexit was called. And you remember the statistics on how many people uh, said that it will be remains. You remember how many people who said it will be Hillary Clinton. Um, and um, on the primer, on the debate nights, we will be processing uh, all the millions of tweets coming in real time, showing you on the map, uh, state by state, or any level of uh, geographical detail, a county or such. Um, how, what kind of sentiment, emotion, topic discussion and all that uh, come out. I have demos of these all, uh, I can give if you have time at the end or at some point later on. Um, one of the examples I remember in the Intel space is that I had a project on insider threat. This was um, because of the uh, president's uh, executive order and um, the research was done in non-classified setting in my lab, and then working with a, a contractor. Uh, one of my students got classific, you know, cl you know, the the uh, TSC clearance, and uh, uh, working with the government contractor, it was deployed at Fort Meade. So we have had uh, quite a bit um, of experience in doing things that have uh, been applied and are uh, operational also. Uh, that said, we do uh, a lot of foundational and a lot of translational research. A lot of what we do um, essentially is motivated by massive amount of data. The growth in data is just uh, humongous. And um, 
the social science techniques that were developed 20, 30, 40 years, including many of the theories we have today, uh, were predates this kind of thing. Uh, a lot of uh, theories were uh, developed uh, when people did experiments uh, in war, getting 20 people, 30 people in a room and having them fill out surveys, answering questions. A lot of others were developed in uh, using the surveys. Now you all remember the success of the surveys during US elections. It was terrible. In the recent US elections, in the last decade, success of the surveys have been terrible. And compared to um, the uh, data-driven techniques that I'm talking about, where we are able to look at millions of um, uh, user volunteer information, not actively sought, volunteer information, I think uh, that thing worked very, very well. And, and um, you know, there's a human in data, there is social media data, there is uh, uh, survey data, and uh, there is uh, machine, you know, collected data, sensory data. So the information is cheap and understanding is expensive. So a lot of what we do has uh, something to do with gaining the understanding from the data, deeper understanding and insight from the data that is actionable. The other point, uh, I, the slide that I removed actually here is that um, US has a lot of expertise in AI, but China is ahead in uh, monetizing an application of AI. So in general, uh, US has been um, not the world leader in application of AI. Um, that was on my mind when we started this AI Institute. Uh, so this is the first AI, you know, UC-wide AI Institute in US Southeast. Um, there are, there is, you know, an institute at MIT, there is an institute at Stanford, uh, but, you know, there are multiple labs and, um, you know, uh, perhaps a few centers um, uh, in the US Southeast, but none that is at the university level. And um, our idea is to really um, focus on AI applications um, while not giving up uh, foundational work also. So we do core AI research in a variety of topics I'll talk about. But we do translational research with nearly all colleges at UFFC already in such a uh, short time, and most of those are funded projects. Another way of saying is that we convert big data into smart data, uh, one that is uh, ready for uh, aiding humans in making decisions. Uh, I'm just doing broad setting of where we are in the whole scope of AI. Um, the other very important thing is that AI is extremely good today when you are uh, doing a very narrowly well-focused task. So you are doing image classification. AI bits, uh, you know, uh, would beat a human. But AI is still very poor in broad spectrum behavior, uh, looking after humans, uh, comparing to humans, um, bringing subject information, behavioral aspects that humans have, um, and uh, something that involves human choices and decisions uh, that are inherently broad spectrum. They have history of biases, culture, and so many other things. These are the things where AI has been very poor. Again, our research has um, essentially uh, more focused towards this newer, this less addressed aspects of the AI. So, um, uh, you know, while AI does very well on some of the top topics listed there, uh, for high levels of machine intelligence, AI is not very good. And this is uh, becomes this comes very, you know, uh, one good example of this is uh, in this uh, automated systems context, automated vehicle context where um, you might have heard of the um, ep um, uh, estimates uh, Elon Musk had said by now, you know, two years ago, uh, he thought uh, we will have autonomous, uh, you know, autonomous vehicles. Where are they? They're not there. And there's no expectation of having level five, um, you know, even level four uh, anytime very, very soon. Um, so um, uh, there are these tasks, uh, uh, the high level task of abstraction, contextualization, analogy, causality, 
these are the things that AI is not very good at, but these are the things that we also specialize in at the AI Institute. Putting in the context of uh, uh, what DARPA has uh, talked about AI, um, uh, in the last century, we did uh, pretty good symbolic AI. Uh, in this century, so far in the first two decades, we have done a lot, um, made a great progress in statistical AI. But neither of them, in the, the important uh, uh, characteristics of statistical AI is that it has led to black box techniques. It can't explain why it has made the decision it has made. And in many situations, that doesn't work. 91% or 92% of the companies have said they want explainable AI. More importantly, imagine a doctor, um, you know, uh, a doctor having a lot of data about patient uh, can't say that the AI system told me to do this. He or she needs to be able to explain how, uh, you know, that particular choice is being made uh, and the basis of uh, and how you are complying with medical guidelines. Uh, you can't be making it in isolation just because data says, says something. So, um, you know, uh, the trusted, explainable AI. Um, so that has, from a computer science perspective, AI perspective, this is leading to a new class of techniques called um, a neurosymbolic AI, uh, which combines the both symbolic and statistical AI and uh, in this institute, uh, we specialize in, and I coined the term knowledge infused learning. Uh, and that is a particular form of neurosymbolic or hybrid AI where uh, the knowledge, typically collective intelligence that humans have uh, developed is brought into the uh, computational process. Uh, and, and so uh, there is a large amount of work that is going on. This is a rather busy slide, but, uh, in the, in, the, in the middle here, or, or you know, in the center, you see a broad variety of AI topics that we uh, work on today. They include a collaborative uh, and multi agent system. That's the area I studies project here. Um, but a, a lot of other topics, as you can see there. And the Important thing, as I mentioned, we have uh, already collaborative projects with uh, majority, uh, most of the um, colleges and schools in this university and many uh, places outside. And these are the areas in which our um, um, projects uh, belong. Uh, so a lot in medical, healthcare, nursing, public health, particularly mental health addiction, uh, epidemiology, and then pharma, all these things you can see here. We have a great uh, uh, collaboration synergy with neuroscientists and cognitive scientists. For example, jointly funded uh, joint research with Institute of Mind and Brain, which is not represented here, but I'm representing. Uh, there's a lot of cognitive scientists, psycholo psychologists there. This is the area, you see social good and harm, uh, where um, inside of threat, disinformation, misinformation, harassment, toxic content, deception, exhumation, radicalization. These are the topics that we work on and that is a lot of human AI element. So um, uh, I will uh, we'll be going through, um, while um, the time we have is not enough to go through uh, all the work we do, uh, I will more focus on uh, projects or ideas in this area uh, and that also uh, at a pretty high level, uh, I encourage you to ask me a question and I'm, then I'll be able to go uh, much more deep uh, depending on what you are interested in in those projects. Um, or we can do follow-up conversations. Anyway, these are the, um, some of the projects uh, that we have, the pro you know, areas in which we have projects already. Um, there's a, uh, this slide kind of gives a broad, um, outline of um, AI with human-centric uh, challenges that we address. So you can see here on one I, I you know, and the social good, and other end you talk about social harm. And um, I did not update this slide, but you can do a lot of, uh, you know, like Zika, Zika virus monitoring or health fight um, depression or support disasters. Then you can talk about you know other things like joking marketing. Then you go to 
harassment, toxicity, you go to uh, rumoring, deception, fake news, misinformation, disinformation, radicalization, extremism, uh, illicit drugs, and so on and so forth. Over the period of time, we have worked on most of these things. Um, and um, some of the systems that we've done have uh, uh, done work at very, very large scale. So for example, in the COVID-19 uh, example I will show, we collected 12 billion tweets and 700,000 uh, news articles in doing the analysis that you have. So here is the uh, is one project, we call it Psychedemic, measuring spatial temporal psychological impact of coronavirus through social quality index. So in, this is inside from a social, you know, uh, social media big data. So here is what we are trying to do here. How does real world events and policy decisions, such as school decision, school closing, non-essential business closing, uh, number of cases, availability of clinical services, vary by time, geography, for example, state, and demography, Gen Z or millennial, impact public and social health, such as mental health, including depression, addiction of variety of kinds, domestic violence. This is open data, but basically uh, we not, not only have, uh, we have 12 billion tweets um, along this line. This is just one example, a tweet that talks about, uh, that is among these 12 billion tweets. So the analysis, for example, could uh, give you this kind of information. And on a, um, you know, uh, both temporal and, uh, and, and spatial, uh, you know, scale. So you can see, study, for example, um, how social quality of index that um, we define based on mental health and addiction issues um, uh, change uh, over the period of time. Uh, and uh, how different states have, uh, you know, uh, progressed. You can study, um, you know, very here we found a cluster of states that behave somewhat similarly. And, uh, you know, their index became better or worse or period of time. And then you can look at the policy choices they made about like closing the schools or, or, or workplaces or such, or opening them up or masking or not, and how this may have affected. Uh, this one here shows you, for example, influence of external events. So you can imagine a lot of possible applications. You can see all of these events that occurred, uh, uh, the choices were made at different, you know, in different, uh, 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 geographical regions by different states or even sometimes at the uh, community level and uh, the other statistics and then uh, our analysis and how they correlate or don't correlate, what kind of uh, you know, connections uh, you could find, what kind of explanations you can create um, from that. You can look at here um, Gen Z versus Malin expressions um, and uh, you can see, for example, um, Gen Z uh, being a lot more uh, susceptible to uh, school closing, uh, millennial, a lot more to the economic uh, you know, choices, decision making and impact uh, kind of things. You can see uh, the drugs that they used were of different class and type as an example. Um, Okay, so that is uh, just an example of one class of um, um, what we did. And there's a lot more on that, but uh, I'm just, I just gave you a very high level view on that. Um, this is a, an outcome of that project uh, uh, that I had called Twitteries, uh, where um, we developed a system to um, analyze um, all the time, all the real, you know, real time data analysis uh, from social media that includes text images, drone footage, uh, satellite images, and so on and so forth. And um, it could help 
accumulating organizations. It could help first order, uh, first response coordinators, individuals, uh, community organizations, or ground up uh, organizations that come up when there is a flood, for example, uh, or hurricane. So, the technology provides situational awareness to assist first responders and humanitarian organizations. This is not interesting. Allah, feel good. Millions of people use social media to share information during many events, including disasters. At Noesis, we have been collaborating with a wide variety of human experts to perform scientific analysis of social and sensor big data during many major natural disasters in real time. What if a tool can analyze, summarize, and draw insights from streaming social media messages? Every tweet, every email, associated sensor and satellite data, and know every relevant location to help government and humanitarian organizations, as well as first responders and volunteer networks to coordinate the response, disaster like that is that good. Twitter users provide witness accounts of the unfolding situation and share their critical needs during natural disasters. Disaster Report provides functionalities for those individuals in need and seeking to fulfill those needs by reaching out to the audience for those social feeds. But after the second feedback we got from professionals from the humanitarian world, Disaster Record now provides aggregate analysis and summaries for governmental agencies and humanitarian organizations, allowing them to monitor and help affect people. We are considering the example of Chennai Floods 2015 in this demo. Let's choose a time range. The tool then provides aggregated and individual level functionalities. Now let's zoom into the Chennai airport area and see what is happening there. We should draw a bounding box to do the aggregation to see rescue and shelter needs clustered by location names. The word cloud here provides the thematic summaries of what is happening in that area. There is a theme of airport remaining shut for a while. And when we go to tweets, we would see in this example that it says the airport will remain shut until December 6th. When you click on the shelter needs, the word cloud themes would change to help, togetherness, and so on. If you click on the Chennai airport location name, you would see that somebody two kilometers away is offering And this, you know, uh, things about helping actually do coordination and other things along, uh, you know, this line. Now, th there's a, um, uh, a variety of work that we do in the language and culture, or we thought we'll just speak that part from Alice and uh, go a little further deep. I'm going to invite my colleague, um, Amitava, uh, to uh, discuss uh, some of the work here, and we'll proceed further. So with this. Thank you, Professor Seth, and thanks, everybody. It's a nice uh, meeting. So let me first introduce me. I'm a research uh, associate professor here. I joined this month, July 1. And uh, let me spend one minute telling my background. Earlier this one, I was a chief scientist in Wipro. If you don't know what is Wipro, it is a very large organization in India, third largest IT industry. It's a home of 250K people. And we, you know, Wipro operate in 66 countries across the globe. So what I did there, I set up a research lab there from a scratch in the industry setup, which is still operating. And uh, before that, I was an assistant professor in Indian Institute. I also taught in Indian School of Business. And uh, I spent my research career across various countries in Japan, in Norway, earlier in the US, in Texas, Austin, and here I'm today. So my primary research area is natural language processing. Obviously, that's my core area. But I also work in the area of social computing and multimodality. So I often talk about this language and culture. And when I talk about this, I use this picture. This is a collage of Adam face with a lot of people. So culture means people. So we need to understand people. So what do I mean by that? So what do I do? I take out a lot of framework from psychology and sociology, apply NLP technique, take out social media data, understand a lot of things, then apply into AI system to solve you know, various problems. So just one example to start with. So this is a Swartz model, which defines the values and ethics of people from sociology, which defines this 10 dimension, power, achievement, benevolence, universalism, and so on and so forth. So this is an excerpt from my four papers or so. So what we did, we created NLP system by looking at somebody's social media profile, we can bucket them into this kind of values and ethics. Okay, and then we can go in social media, we can find out communities, and there are a lot of you know, uh, you know, techniques are there in AI and so on. And then we can average. It's, like, it's, an, it's not you know, general average, entropy-based kind of average. And then we try to understand, okay, how, how the society is being formed. What are the communities across the you know, uh, United States here? 
So, for example, if you look at, you know, very negative power achievement is a kind of very negative, you know, values and ethics. Benevolence universalism is the most positive and hedonism is somewhere in, in between. So if you look at any big cities in the United States, I mean, starting from, you know, the Dallas, where I used to live earlier, and New York, New Jersey, Chicago, San Francisco, whatever, the big, 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 big cities. So a lot of people are filled up with power and achievement. I mean, that's the way any society is in the, in the world. I mean, the United States is not different. But if you go inside the country, you find more people are positive. You know, they care about their neighborhood, their society, and Hawaii is the most hedonic place supposed to be. Okay, again, this is the analysis from the Twitter sphere. Okay, I mean, we may or may not have a direct connection with the census data. We are doing that. So what is the connection of Twitter sphere with the census data? So this is a nice analysis. And we did also similar thing from India and et cetera, cross culture analysis and so on. Now, well, this is fantastic phenomenon, but what is the application of it? So we have a lot of applications. So to, to give more detail about this, if you don't know Swarge model and et cetera, so it has a lot more detail in the right side. Uh, not only the same dimension, you can go much deeper in, into the dimension uh, of this, you know, values and ethics. And also there are super classes of these values and ethics, you know, four dimension, you know, uh, more traditional, more power oriented, more self transcendent and so on. So we can do a lot more that analysis as well. Okay. So coming here in social computing, NLP, the, and AI crossroad, I often talk about this thing. So I say it's a, it's a multifaceted problem. In one hand, we have to understand society, culture, and all those things. For example, these are the things I do typically. Personality, values and ethics, optimism, pessimism, dark tribe. So, so many models we pick up from psychology and sociology, and we build AI model for that. On the right, you know, this side, content. So, head speech or misinformation might have several categories, political, religious, sexism, racism, fake news, how much hate it is, how much fake it is, the label of aggression and so on. And then you understand the network, the, the graph of the you know, social network, community, hyperpartition, hyperpluralism, and so on and so forth. Now, when you apply all these things together, you gain understanding how people behave in terms of mis and you know, disinformation. For example, here, I may not have time to go deeper about this analysis and so on. So you found out details, how people react on, you know, hate speech on the social media based on the dark trade analysis. So what we found very interestingly, so two questions we had. One is who, who start the hate speech in social media? Who is the initiator? I mean, I, I don't like it, I like it, I comment it and so on. Who started? So we found 70% people have some kind of dark trade orientation who started. What kind of, what kind of people start what kind of hate speech? They're situated where? What is the demography? What is the age? What is the gender? So we found out a lot of poor you know, analysis and correlation. So these are some, you know, some such you know, visualization. Now, confirmation bias. I'm quite sure you know what is confirmation bias. In social media, we see a lot of things and we support. We support because we already believe that that's possible. So that's called confirmation bias. So can we apply in psychology and sociology to understand this kind of confirmation bias? So these are something except from our recent two uh, tutorial uh, with my colleague from Microsoft and Adobe and Triple ID in Delhi. Again, I do not have time to go in all the details, so you can stop me uh, anytime you want to. So what I supposed to show you here is we build a simulator. So it's a, it's a real time simulator. You can see a nice graph. So looking at the graph, you can see given a miss or disinformation, how it is getting simulated. I mean, the diffusion. So somebody post it, it is visible to the first top of network. Then somebody do reaction, go to the second hop and so on. So that, that video and visualization was here. So why this diffusion is important? Because creating complete automation in hate speech or fake news is impossible. You can't do it. So the way, I mean, this is a project from Helios. I am the PI here. And we sell this out to two Indian uh, organizations called Times of India and Statesman. So what is impossible is complete automation. We can't do it. So what we do here in simulation, it predict what is going to affect a lot of people. And then, you know, shortlist them and send them to the, you know, reporter. Say, hey, you look at this top 100. These are going to affect a lot of people. Okay, so that this simulation does. This is the architecture. We don't have time for this. Focused. So, um, we 
we have a uh, NSF funded project. Um, uh, this is applied project convergence uh, accelerator project uh, where uh, we have finished phase one and uh, we have made phase two proposal. In two years, we have to build an operational system. Um, and in this case, um, what Amitava talked about was uh, identification of misinformation, fake news, and such. Uh, here, the focus is on um, uh, action, you know, decision making, um, and the challenges that uh, human decision makers face in presence of misinformation. So, um, uh, uh, if there is a um, uh, here it shows a particular. Uh, misinformation related to contaminated water during the hurricane, or uh, you know, certain disease or fuel shortage or dam failure. How does that uh, misinformation spread, and how what information the decision maker need so that they can uh, effectively engage with their community? Uh, and uh, you know, um, uh, an example is that. Um, uh, the a, a school superintendent is going to go to school board meeting, and uh, he or she would like to um, get a sense of what would the board, what does the um, community uh, members uh, think about masking policy, or what they believe in vaccination, and um, right or wrong. The point is that they need to have pulse of the public that they serve and that they need to factor in um, or they and, and they also need to be able to counter the information. So uh, if they, let's say there was a particular misinformation and they uh, put out a, a correction, uh, they put out a, a kind of um, uh, uh, public notice uh, about uh, that being misinformation. Has it, is it making impact on the community? Has, the, has it been noticed by the thing? Uh, a, um, a reporter started uh, you know, with the fake news that the reporter who is not even local talks about something that happened here, happened to be fake news. You put out the correction, has he now responded to that? And is that being you know, uh, uh, consumed by the community or not? So it is this kind of thing that we are predicting. The Crisis Observatory application, or COCAST for short. In this dashboard, you see a state map overlaid with an information and misinformation node network. The information node network is in green and symbolizes the spread of correct information across social platforms, such as Twitter, by the South Carolina Emergency Management Division, or SCEP. The misinformation known network is in red and symbolizes the spread of contested or otherwise false information by users other than the SCEFD. Currently, the dashboard is showing the spread of correct information and misinformation regarding a fuel shortage. The larger nodes are sources of misinformation with interest and the lines depict spread based on Twitter geolocation data and time frame. Smaller nodes are points that have been spread too. The size of the node depicts the popularity of the topic in that area. The initial red node is represented with a flag above the node, and upon clicking, examples and context of the social media data in that area are presented. The Venn diagram of circles on the lower left of the dashboard gives topics of the misinformation by prevalence, which is represented by size. The Venn diagram topics will alter and differentiate over time. The spread of a crisis may be observed in a seven day series from day one to day two all the way to day seven. The slider on the bottom right can also be dragged to see the rate of expansion of a topic and the geographic spread of that misinformation, followed by the spread of correct information. The crisis observatory application allows for public information officers to understand the spread of information across the state. 
It may assist in determining the awareness of the public of an emergency and the effectiveness of the spread of correct information. Um, so, um, you know, it's a sense making tool to help the simic address the burden of uh, overwhelming misinformation during a crisis. And, you know, we talk to a variety of uh, people. Um, uh, the, these kind of things have real world uh, information. You know, thing here is a, this actual quote from, you know, one of our users or, or potential users and so on and so forth. And so, you know, these are the uh, planned work uh, in this general area. Um, also, there is a simulation uh, tool that will be developed uh, so that uh, uh, humans uh, involved in this process can be trained. Um, I remember uh, we did a work with um, police department in Dayton, um, where uh, there was a KKK rally. There was a counter rally by um, uh, Antifa, and there was a third, uh, you know, program concurrently by the uh, officials, government officials, and leaders uh, about the issue. And um, you know, it's a mix of any mix of these very diverse things on, and um, um, being able to monitor that uh, the our tool was actually used by you know by the police department. In other case, uh, we did the simulation where uh, 17 agencies in the metro area came together. Uh, these are all the first responder and emergency management agencies. And um, they wanted to, uh, they did a simulation uh, related to uh, the uh, dirty bomb uh, scenario, a couple of dirty bombs going on and people rushed to the hospitals and many other things. Uh, we took the data from Boston bombing and repurposed it uh, for uh, this simulation environment uh, for a different location. And uh, the information officer were able to see in the real time the challenges in using that information and then acting upon that and informing uh, the others that they need to inform. So those are the kind of stuff that, um, so this is kind of, you know, glimpse of the future system that we had developed um, that was that one use that was the election, uh, you know, monitoring this system, uh, pretty much as we developed became uh, the uh, core system that uh, uh, is used by Cognome Labs, the company that I founded. I did not run this company this time, but uh, much of the same software got used and then for the extra point. And my own three uh, of the students, uh, you know, people trained in my thing became the main technical employee for that company. Um, and, and uh, also brought millions of dollars in, you know, expenditure in the local region and such. Uh, so, um, uh, okay. Now, another very uh, interesting uh, area of research has been radicalization, extremism. Uh, Amita will say something about uh, uh, the work that uh, he has done and um, my own team, oh, no, there's a complimentary work that is done um, in, you know, that I'll talk about. Go ahead. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks. So radicalization, uh, you know, organization like ISI and others, you know, using it, you know, effectively for these purposes, recruitment, propaganda, fundraising, and many other purposes. And these two examples actually astonish the world. The first one called Shami Witness, who is a very, you know, coming from a very wealthy family from India, you know, engineer, have been working for a company, well paid and you know well settled but he is the man who started all the isis recruitment in india you know working from bangalore and this one everybody knows the guy from us who flew to middle east and become the isis terrorist russell denison and this is a report from heritage organization very old 2014 15 and these are only known sources there are many unknown sources us got 250 recruitment over social media uh, from for ISIS and India has many few thousand and so on and these are kind of advertisement they you know you know propagate in the social media that come to us you know we have this lifestyle for you so and many more so what we did this is Professor Shade and uh, team they did it so it's a kind of content analysis so look at the content and what kind of you know 
uh, inside we can draw either religious, ideological, or hate. So, you know, whether they can fall in all the buckets or they can fall in one bucket. And can we apply, you know, deep semantic technique, knowledge graph technique, and et cetera, to understand? Because this understanding is not very easy. It's very difficult to understand what people are saying in terms of metaphor and language and so on. So they developed such technology and they published on that. What I do and have been doing on this is again, applying psychosociological models and trying to understand who are the people possible, you know, for the, you know, recruitment. I mean, they're not coming to me. They're coming to some people, right? And who are they? What is their background? What are their sociology? What is their age? What is their gender? So can we know that? So we collected a lot of data. We collected data for two years. How we collected data, I can possibly come here and I can. So this is, this is called control sec in Twitter, which nobody knows they're operating from where they're unknown, anonymous, probably from France. So what they do, is, you can check it now. So every two hours, they you know, keep reporting the ISI's official account. Twitter also follows them and you know, they keep blocking this account. And what we do in five to six hour window we get, we collect data. So we have a lot of data. And these are ISI's official Twitter handles, officials. And they have titles, major, colonel, whatever. So what we did, so we collected a lot of such data and we you know, applied analysis, psychosociological analysis and try to understand who are those people. So now if you look at this data chart, which says three things, personality, values, and age, gender, and the demographic here. And the people who are possible for recruitment, and we have also, you know, uh, you know, corroborated this with the actual recruitment happen with the NI data in India. So uh, we, we found out achievement, benevolence, conformity, hedonism are re reasonably high than the normal population. And whereas neurotic, I mean, they are pretty sentimental people, obviously, and you, uh, people use their sentiment. They are pessimistic. Obviously, they are male oriented because you know they could be potentially you know be used as terrorists. So this is a kind of very large scale data analysis, and we, we published this in SONAM on various other conferences. So this gives us kind of understanding, you know, what are the people you know they are looking for. And then uh, again, the video is not playable, anyways. So then we started, you know, knowing what is the radicalization process. I mean, uh, I mean, it's not that you know day one somebody becomes the radical, right? So there are processes. Some sometimes people are neutral, sympathizer, justifier, and then they become something. And there are a lot of other things, you know, happening here. So there are second or third kind of organization who actually recruit them, train them, and then they pass it on to ISIS or this kind of organization. So I have such data to show. So what we did here. Uh, okay, so this is some analysis from National Intelligence Agency in India. So this is the, you know, a state called Kerala from India, which is uh, here. It got the most recruitment, few thousand uh, for ISIS. And those people are not recruited directly from Kerala. They're recruited all across the nation, various states. And they got, you know, recruited by some other agencies, got trained there, and then they pass it on to ISIS finally. And these are the people, I'm just you know, putting some of the name. And we also found out their Twitter handle that time. It, this is a little back, five years back. So, and we analyzed those data. So what we did, this is a lot of manual analysis and manual annotation we did. So we, we believe this is the uh, definition of radicalization process. We did not develop this. I have looked into various journalistic research and various other psychological research. So it's a kind of more or less, this is the definition exists today. I mean, we can go much deeper, but that does not exist today. So we, if we say activist, radical, inert, vulnerable, and so on, and then we collected data of 70 primary ISIS account, their first top of network, which is around this 100K, and their second top of network, so around this very big. So it's a very large scale data. And we, we manually annotate by this definition, we build up this annotation guideline, we argued, we you know, spend a lot of time. And we analyze and try to understand what is happening. Because this ISIS account are getting followed by a lot of people, even journalists, they want to get updated. Even politicians, they want to know what they're doing. So what we finally come up with, uh, and also the network, how they, how they operate, how they communicate, who communicate with whom. So this is a kind of, and we also assign lethality score, who probably you human annotator think could be more lethal. 
in terms of vulnerability, the recruitment in the coming one year or two years. So we annotated such data. And then again, we started analyzing such data by looking at, okay, so if I say it's a, it's a vulnerable people, radical people, inert people, activist people, how they you know behave in terms of all these socio and psychological parameters we developed using NLP and all those kind of methods. And we clearly see there is a huge difference. We can differentiate people. They're not same. Again, then we apply this to you know, automatically identify a lot of things. Then another work we started on, uh, this, this network is very dynamic. And it's fascinating thing about this terrorist networking over uh, Twitter is they got renewed in almost every 72 hours. How? So let me tell you. So if you look at this network, in this network, you can see groups, right? So small, 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 small groups. And every group, there is a you know, central node. And a lot of things, a lot of people are followers. So what they do, central node, because they got identified in you know, 42 hours or whatever. And then they delete it. All the followers start following you know, the central node too. And then he come appear again. And all the network again start following him. So in 70, almost 72 hours, this whole network changed completely. So now the question is how we can design technique to stop this? Because blocking account is not going to work. They know how to play around this. So can we create you know, destabilization technique using network and you know, other kind of methodology? So this is a destabilization method. If this is a network, what node you have to delay? How you have to stop the communication and all those things? So we started off with the idea called permanence. So this is a network idea. So which says who is connected with which part of the network that much and how you can cut that down this communication channel so you can destabilize the whole network very quickly and very effectively. And then we have different problems. We have sleeper cells, we have you know, lone wolf. And the sleeper cells also exist in social media. I mean, they are very inactive, inert for you know, years. Then something happened and they start you know, talking about that. Even they use a lot of bots. So these are some publications. Yeah, and uh, there are some slides that I'm not showing here, but um, um, often our work has, all, you know, because we are collaborative um, in one of our work, we use collaboration with uh, Dr. Achino, uh, he's a Dharma, he's a political scientist, and his theory about religion built upon uh, ideal, religion, ideology, and violence. And so we are able to adapt our knowledge use learning AI techniques. Uh, so, for example, for this religion, uh, we created knowledge graph from uh, uh, Quran and Hadith. Um, and so, all the concepts, um, and, and you understand jihad used in a positive sense, jihad in Quran, jihad used by extremists in a very different way. So, this kind of uh, knowledge is created, and that knowledge is then applied. For example, we developed a uh, pipeline of the, the five step process uh, that uh, recruiters. So we got uh, data for real uh, recruiting cases um, uh, and how uh, the persuasion uh, techniques went uh, and how ultimately uh, Texas youth was, you know, uh, recruited and she flew to, uh, you know, ISIS land. That kind of uh, issue and understanding of uh, how different buttons were used, how religion was used, how religion was used, when the person was, um, you know, then incited to engage in violence. Those are the things that we studied also uh, that I'm not showing here. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, have, have, who would be the clients for this? You, you got funded by FRL and the Office of uh, Air Force. Science. No, this is this is a different one. Yeah, so yeah. the two way different things. Yeah. Uh, where does it go? Where, where does oh, it go? The, the previous one, the declaration, yeah. obviously government. Obviously did government. It, did it go into government already? Uh, yes, sometimes government agencies, uh, they don't want to, you know, announce we are funding you. They are giving you fund, you know, secretly and do the work secretly because many times you cannot publish all so, these things. So there is, so you're already doing that. So that, that program, is already going to government on contract. We're talking about the previous program. The previous program. Yeah, this is the next project. Yeah, yeah this is the next one. This is the next one. The previous, the previous one, one, yes. Is that already going to government? That, that yeah, some government agencies, yes, have been talking to us oh, when I was in India. Yeah. 
Oh, when you were in India? Yes. Oh, okay. So, but not the United States? Not the United well, States. Well, I, I gave one example of the United States, my uh, work that I did in, in Southern Fed, that um, actually was the employer for the under uh, thing. The research was not classified. The technology development was not classified, but the data used, uh, you know, on specific cases, that was classified. So we developed the system uh, a, in industry academic situation. We worked with a, a contractor, and uh, one of my students, as I said, got uh, uh, you know the clearance, and uh, of course the contractor had clearance, and then they went and worked at Fort Meade to deploy the system. So that's the process that often goes. Uh, we are not really likely to do uh, uh, classify our work here in the United States anytime soon. But uh, past models have worked there. Uh, this kind of model I've done like, you know, pretty well. Uh, and that's probably the easier and better way to do the things. Uh, so there will be cases where, again, in some cases, technology will be classified, but in some cases, technology by itself is okay. Its application is fine, right? It's data. Well, uh, yeah. This is a, a very interesting project that we did with funded. Uh, uh, we have some positive indication, but uh, we don't have one yet. So this is project work for UCCS. Yeah. So the ASSR logo is there incorrectly, or is this right. represented? Yeah, not yet for that. We should know that. Yeah, 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 sure. Right. No, so I. Got it, right. It's just a contract. Got it. Yep. But the requirements come. Okay, so <laughs> so let me briefly just talk about this project. I mean, we got you know various positive feedback from them. So the idea is, I mean, uh, polygraph test is a you know very difficult process. You have to go through the you know code and all those legislation is very difficult. So can AI help here? Can it be recorded all the interrogation and can AI be you know help here to understand somebody's slang? So when we look at uh, you know psychology and you know we found out these three kind of definition broadly three kind of you know lies omission commission and influence omission is somebody knowingly omitting some part of information so that's a kind of lie commission somebody is deliberately lying at face influence i'm not telling omitting i'm not deliberating i'm telling a lot of other stories actually i'm diverting it so there's three kind of you know lies so we said, we, I mean, this is a small project, so we cannot do all the three in one go. We said, we pick the first one. So the omission kind of thing. So can AI help here to find out somebody's omitting meaningful information here? So then how we can find out what is the meaningful information, then we look at, look at the definition of journalism. It says 5W define any event, who, what, when, where, and why. Even journalists do that. If you look at a story, see all the Ws are present. If the Ws are present, it's comprehensive. Otherwise not. So is that guy who is sitting in front of camera is mentioning all the W's clearly to me? If not, I can prompt the interrogator, hey, this guy is possibly hiding something there. Poke him there. Okay. So that's the idea. And we can create a lot of data using you know, AI technique and all those you know, five W involving NLP and LNG technique and so on. And we also wanted to do multimodal analysis, for example, you know, head position, lip movement, eye tracking, and this and that. But probably they said probably for the phase two or the phase one. But that's something we'll be starting hopefully very soon. So that's the deception. Now, moving on uh, to the next part. So which is multimodal hate and fake news. So this is a workshop we started off uh, this year. Uh, with the triple AI, hopefully we'll be continuing this with the next year and so on. It's a series. We call it defactify. Okay. And it has two buckets, factify and emotion. So the first row is the fake news. And you can see, obviously, the first image of Trump and Osama bin Laden, they never met, obviously, it's a doctor image. The second one, somebody saying if people are, you know, put into kind of isolation for COVID and you know, all those things. The third one, obviously, is a Photoshopped image and so on. So these are fake news over the social media. The second one are the head speech, the multimodal head speech. And uh, I like the creativity of this guy. So the black 
and the, and the other color should be you know segregated but it's very difficult to get it i mean we can understand this even it, it takes you know time for me to understand what it is being said but then identifying this automatically using ai technique is very complicated it's not very easy so what we did in this workshop we released the biggest data set available on the in the in the research community now we we released around 10k fractified data and 10k memotion data and this is a memotion two because we, we did memotion earlier as well memotion one so this is a nice uh, you know workshop a lot of people participated and we discussed so, uh, you know, it's, it's also interesting data aspects of it yeah. right. so then uh, obviously it's, it's a big challenge and we have to solve a lot of problems you know before solving here so what we are doing here again the video will not be played here so if you know technique wise very briefly if you look at nlp what to make and, and other kind of language model word gpt which are now being you know talked about everywhere in the ai is the backbone for everything in the nlp but if you look at multimodality those kind of basic techniques are not available so what we have been developing we have been developing joint model embedding we call it imaginator which gives you much more contextual you know representation for example boy versus girl distance in a vector space man versus woman distance are quite you know equivalent so these are called imaginators there's a joint model you know embedding which is going as a back one of various multiple tasks not only motion rectify but also you know image captioning and various other factors okay now we have been talking so much about social media but social media is not monolingual it's multilingual i don't know whether this colors are visible at the big map but this is the twitter language map and each color represent one language and this is worldwide i know it's not visible i'll come i'll zoom in this is the us although i can't zoom in little more here in the powerpoint uh, if really i could have done that but there are a lot of red spots there let's say if you just zoom in there are a lot of spanish speaking people and more on this is new york and see the language groups we have spanish we have portuguese we have japanese we have russian we have korean and so on so language is a very integral part of social media and more than 50% is non english but the challenge here is the video will not be played okay the challenge here is when people use other languages they do not use their script typically i mean this is very true for india other languages is true as well so they mix up two languages together so one word in english two words in mexican or spanish and then another complete sentence and it's also true for other languages and it's a very common phenomenon so this phenomenon is called code mixing i mean i have been i mean i started working from very scratch on this topic from last 5 or 6 year i did a lot of things even started things from scratch so organized several workshop and etc here so this is the kind of language people speak and not only text but if you look at multimodal content also also the same thing so we have to solve this problem otherwise we can't solve the problem what else we have to do we have to throw those 50% of data see we don't understand this language we can't solve this so what we did this is a recent paper we we got you know inspired from physics and the electromagnetic wave and we applied that in a neural network and we have a screen here and whenever we got a junction of language so for example i or enjoy kare i or is a hindi word and then you switch to enjoy english and then and then again you switch to hindi so these are the switching points where language change so when the language change we change the electromagnetic wave you know orientation in the neural network how the complex story i'm not going here and that works really well and we developed a technique called conflator is a mixture of two language which is really working fine for this kind of languages code mixing and uh, this is a kind of heat map we show at those junction points our model is actually learning well is you know emphasizing those pointers okay so finally before uh, moving to some other topics this is something maybe not directly related to you know what we have been discussing here uh, in recent time we are you know very much enthusiastic about 
you know, not in not only neural network, but also in physics and bringing that into AI and neural network. So this is a recent development. My Wipro team and my PhD student have been started on and working on this. We are taking the idea of gravitational wave and bringing that to neural network. And the language model we are developing, we are calling it Irandal, and which already shown some good results. And we are bringing idea like, you know, space, time, uh, mass, and, you know, elasticity. And we are defining language in terms of these four things and, you know, putting that into, you know, language model. Over to you, Professor Seth. Uh, is Peyton or Sai here? Why don't you guys come and talk about it? So my name is Peyton. I'm an undergraduate researcher here um, on a summer internship under uh, Dr. Vignesh Narayanan. Um, so uh, broadly, our project that we're working on here is concerned with modeling um, information spread in um, a system of um, highly complex agents. Um, so the idea is that you'll have a target audience um, you will uh, model them in a simulation, and then you'll have uh, output from that simulation, uh, which will allow you to analyze how these agents change over time uh, with respect to the information that you have infused into the system. So, uh, so um, more specifically, um, our role here at the University of South Carolina um, is sort of twofold. Uh, the first is to I create prototypes using a software called NetLogo, uh, which Teja is more familiar with than uh, myself, uh, but to sort of, uh, like I said, create prototypes uh, for this uh, larger scale project. Um, and uh, Teja, if you wanted to talk a little bit about NetLogo. Uh, hello, everyone. This is Teja. Uh, I'm a graduate student in USC, uh, working under Biplo and Vignesh. And in this project, I'm working on the agent-based agent modeling using the NetLogo simulation. Uh, using the NetLogo simulation, we are, uh, NetLogo model, we are creating a simulation uh, by representing some agents in the virtual environment. Like you see here, uh, the red agents and blue agents, and also there are some agents in violet and green. And uh, there are some agents called information disseminant agents in our model, which, uh, it's the information to the other uh, agents in the model, and uh, it will uh, thereon transfer the information from one uh, one agent to another agent based on their interests. Uh, first, suppose if the information disseminant agent uh, spreads an information about politics, and if the agent that received the information uh, is interested in politics, and if the stance matches the topic, then the uh, spread goes on in a positive way and if it doesn't match and if he has a negative uh, opinion on that the information spreads in a negative way and this is how we plan to present the information spread using the NetLogo model and based on the and at each tick uh, we are getting some output of this uh, each agent like what is the state of each agent and based on the agent state uh, Peyton is working on creating some knowledge graphs uh, like at, uh, at this particular tick, what's the um, state of the agent, what is his opinion, and what information he's having, and uh, how he's behaving in the network. And this is how we are uh, trying to simulate the information spread using the NetLogo and also the ontology. Thank you. Okay. Sure. Uh, so I think uh, so Amit, I will just like to highlight one thing and hi everyone. Uh, one of the very interesting things which uh, the team here is doing is uh, not only it is simulating various situations and uh, uh, environment, we are also doing it in a modular way uh, using the knowledge graph, which is being shown here. So what it actually provides us is the ability to extend the simulation very quickly 
and that information goes back to the simulation model. And if you find some interesting ideas, we actually can capture that back and put it into the knowledge graph. So that's one advantage. And the second thing is the knowledge graph acts as the organizational uh, memory. So for example, we can auto generate uh, various kinds of uh, glossities. What are the different terms? Who are the different people? Uh, how the, has the world evolved? So there are two uses of knowledge graph here. One is for auto generating the configuration files, which feeds the simulation and vice versa. And the second one is acting as a knowledge, uh, as an enterprise memory to extend and put all the information together. Just wanted to highlight that. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Okay. So um, I think the rest, are, uh, uh, you know, we probably covered 20% of what we do. Uh, the rest, I'm uh, going to go extremely fast. Again, please stop me if you want to go, uh, you know, uh, go into more detail. Um, but there is, uh, I'll try to make a connection to the uh, human elements and, you know, in AI. Um, we have, at, at USC, we have a very large project called ABC. Uh, it is Aging Brain Cohort. And um, this one uh, is very ambitious, a large project where uh, there are uh, people recruited from age 20 to 80. And a uh, lot of different data is collected. Um, and ultimately trying to understand uh, the uh, change in human cognition, ability for humans to, uh, and a cognitive ability basically of human. And uh, what we are trying to do here is to, um, uh, 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 Usha, you want to come and just say two words uh, or two sentences about this? So Usha, you know, is a PhD student, but she's leading this project, go ahead. So here the use case we are dealing with is aphasia um, and the discourse analysis over here is the analysis that we have uh, conducted uh, for the two pictures called cat rescue and cookie theft. So those pictures will be shown to the um, older adults and we'll be asked to describe that picture. So that is what we call discourse analysis. And at this moment it is being done uh, manually and it is a time intensive process. So. So basically, uh, two kinds of people are involved. First of all, when the patient or uh, subject comes to the clinic, um, there is data collected, and um, this uh, person uh, conducts uh, gives the test. Yeah. And then there are people uh, on the back end that will take the test results. These are forms that have been filled out, and then write up analysis of you know whether the four concepts in the picture show his. Uh, you know, uh, this guy is mentioned by the person correctly or not, and so many other things. Yeah. Um, and this is a very time consuming job. And this is just what, and this, by the way, this project is led by uh, Julius Ferguson, whom you're going to back with. There are similar projects across the, uh, you know, our, our campus. Uh, we uh, recently sent out a very large proposal uh, for AI Institute that is autism. And uh, then, uh, for example, uh, we are doing special education children, and uh, they have autism, they have, uh, you know, uh, other other neurodevelopment diseases. Uh, it, it is one process, for example, where um, you're trying to decide uh, a special education teacher takes 30 to 60 minutes to interview a student and then write a very little report to decide whether the student needs special education or not. These are, first of all, uh, the, the social education teacher has to be uh, quite educated, uh, trained with the protocol, uh, collect a lot of data, analyze it, and put in. So there are many things in the world uh, where um, we want to understand uh, human from this perspective, whether it's aphasia or autism or what cognitive uh, capabilities, uh, human performance and uh, cognition as in general. A area of wide interest to AFRL or a post. The idea here is to use a bunch of AI techniques to both effectively collect data, perhaps <coughs> in an online setting, as opposed to what today has to be done in an online setting, and automate the process uh, to uh, then give you the score. For example, the score could be a MOCA score, uh, which tells you the cognitive capability of a person. A score would be uh, the one that is used by error. And 
be able to explain why you came up with the conclusion that you did. And if you can do that well, and now you're working on at least three such projects, then the tremendous efficiency and scaling of this kind of activity. Uh, you can have a lot more subjects, a lot of different types of subjects, results can be obtained in real time and so on. Uh, we have speech features, audio features, and the textual features. So we have about uh, more than 100 features available, but we are dealing with text features to predict what aspects of spoken language, like the verbs they use, the noun index, and the other uh, uh, textual features that we can extract from the spoken language of those discourse, discourse uh, text analysis. So we are trying to predict what aspects of spoken language can predict the mild moderate or severe cognitive impairment uh, in older adults and what factors related to brain health can act as predictors of cognitive decline and how natural language understanding can help create uh, such models and what is the relationship between the MOCA score and the language they're using in the discourse text and the brain health in normal aging. Uh, so these are the pictures I'm talking about. So uh, the, <clears throat> the patient, the, uh, the, uh, the, the particular adult need not uh, describe the picture in specific order. So it is really challenging, like whether all the main concepts are covered in their speech. So the speech is later transcribed into text. So some information might be lost over there too. But uh, so it, it becomes challenging to identify the main concepts, especially if they reinstate, restate the same information after each other as such. So. And this is the MOCA assessment sheet uh, where it is done manually. And um, so we are trying to predict the MOCA score directly to reduce the manual intensive process over here. Yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll let go of the details. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so there are some details that we are, but in, in general, there are many opportunities for us to. Um, we, we may initially do more in the NLP uh, and text, but uh, we are clearly going to multimedia. We have several uh, projects going on with uh, computer vision, uh, image understanding, and um, uh, that way uh, the activity of a human would be understood at a far more granular level than is done. Um, here is a project which involves uh, predicting autism, um, you know, and creating new biomarker. In this case, uh, we use um, ECG and visual attention uh, to, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, predict the likelihood of uh, autism. Uh, and, the, you know, so automatic recognition, whether the infant is looking at the, uh, you know, game or not, uh, whether responding to the voice command uh, instruction by the parent and so on and so forth. So, all of those things uh, come into picture along with ECG. Um, here's a project, uh, you know, uh, in this project originally is how um, uh, I started working with Amitava, but this involves um, a consortium effort with IIT Patna, Vipro and AI Institute. And this involves um, uh, essentially use of AI in uh, creating knowledge graph, uh, text simplification, summarization, question answering um, with uh, potential application, likely applications to pharma. Um, we have worked uh, with Bosch uh, International on autonomous vehicles. Uh, this is again, very innovative where uh, we are using knowledge graph uh, and it combined with the vision uh, to better understand um, uh, the uh, scenes uh, and how humans react to the scenes and similar scenes and so on and so forth. Um, I mean, this work was uh, noticed by the uh, chief uh, president of the Bosch uh, research uh, and then they uh, recently gave us a $50,000 cash gift. Um, but the work continues on. Causality is another very important topic and we are doing very exciting work in this area. And we are now applying this area to work to a metaverse, which is another interesting thing going on. Uh, this is in collaboration with Siemens. Um, uh, so uh, understanding and representing causal and counterfactual phenomena in artificial engine systems. But this causality thing has a lot of applications all around. Um, so that's very exciting uh, uh, area uh, applied to the uh, driving scenes. 
um, uh, and it's very unique effort. Uh, this is very well noticed by the research community. Another area of work that you know that is spread around our institute has to do with conversational AI and communicating. And uh, we all know about the chatbots, but most of the chatbots are uh, simple instructional uh, things. You ask them a question: What is weather today? Or purchasing and all that. Uh, the real um, value of the chatbot would be when it really supports a human activity. For example example, maintain your mental health. Uh, you, you go and see a doctor, then your next trip to the doctor, visit to doctor is after three months. How do you do self-management of your chronic disease, as an example? In particular, we work, do a lot of work in mental health uh, area. Uh, and and uh, one of the things I should say about AI Institute is that these works are not in isolation done you know, by computer scientists only. Uh, we All the projects that you heard, we have access to a psychologist or a psychiatrics or mental health professionals. Uh, so we have a you know um, a famous uh, you know uh, Dr. Mira Narsimhan uh, in, in in mental health. She's a collaborator as an example. And so here, uh, uh, you know, uh, patient doctor consultation. We've done speech analysis uh, uh, of the real patient doctor conversations and uh, analyze them. Uh, we uh, work on how do you uh, use patient history, uh, uh, the context of uh, the, the recent uh, this, uh, things that patient has said, the medical knowledge to construct the next question you're going to ask to reach to an objective of understanding what patient is talking about and, and what patient, what kind of help patient would need. Um, uh, we have, uh, you know, health chatbot application to Asthma, personalized nutrition is another very exciting area, mental health, uh, and um, it, you know, uh, IoT, Internet of Things, and sensor data, and smartwatch, and uh, uh, you know, Fitbit, and all that kind of stuff. So, in this particular case, we uh, consented uh, about 200 patients, collected data, uh, you know, set for over 150 patients. These are pediatric asthma patients, 29 different parameters. Ability to collect 1,852 data points per patient per day, and from that we developed a phenotype biomarker uh, for for recognizing this uh, understanding uh, dashboard real-time analysis. We were able to see correlations uh, between the phenotypes and uh, you know exposures and things of that nature. Uh, di diet uh, and nutrition. So we have a project with type one diabetes patient and understanding the carbohydrate content. Uh, but it's very exciting because this involves um, very challenging AI techniques, not only image recognition, but volume estimation, very hard problem. Nutritional information, uh, food recommendation, so any applications to type 1 diabetes and hypertension, uh, but pretty sophisticated uh, uh, image analysis work and use of knowledge bases in that area. Uh, hmm? Or discussions and also or if would it be okay with you and your partner to share these with sure yeah these slides are available so we can share uh manufacturing digital twins uh you know and other areas education and so so i think i think let me just end that here uh you know uh and uh, we can take the questions sure um yeah the digital twins uh So uh, we have four, uh, three or four funded projects um, uh, that are in smart manufacturing uh, and uh, use of digital twins very much in that. But digital twin is pretty broad concept that is now used for healthcare and many other situations. The idea is to uh, use um, uh, you know, uh, the data collection uh, from the, um, uh, let's see, this, why is this not showing up? Uh, data collection um, on the factory floor and uh, uh, having all that digital representation and then being able to predict the, uh, analyze for error, exceptions, predict uh, what happens in the future, um, look at the uh, shop floor, uh, the fog age level and enterprise level. So that's, uh, you know, NSF, um, NASA and uh, South Kenya have all funded projects in the area of uh, digital twins and, and, and smart manufacturing. Along with 
you have to very much in it. So that it sits in that building that's so over there in space. So right. that factory is yep. And so can certainly get you more about that. And let me say that this future factory is a different community. It's also big in this area yep. of the Savannah River Lab because they want to protect their manufacturing operation yep. and control system. So that was a question of more that you were going to how close does Carlos get to things like that? Yep. Yeah, I know you're working yes. directly with companies, but protection of manufacturing systems. So AI still plays a pretty substantial role, though, in in those kind of things. A lot because there's a lot of data, and then uh, you know. I was also interested if you could jump to maybe the other six slide. I wanted to see again just briefly the the people and the U.S. Um, the slide that you flashed just very briefly that shows that the sponsors of the world. Oh, uh, uh, so. Um, Here is doing with the, the supply chain and yeah. kind of interconnecting. You know, in my world, I call it model based systems engineering. Yeah. You know, creating models that interconnect all the engineering documentation from requirements to yeah. procurement to, you know, OEM information to, you know, a integrated solution at the very end. Um, you know, obviously, very concerned or, or very interested, not yeah. concerned, very interested in how those models. Get developed, what can mean, you know, running AI against some of those. Mm -hmm. um, but most importantly, taking that and understanding where our critical technical data is leaving our control space, yeah. right? Throughout that entire, you know, end to end set of processes mm -hmm. uh, is an area where, you know, we're just watching what they're doing with, with the folks up in uh, BMW and all the manufacturing components to put together a, a yeah. you know, a car. Mm -hmm. Taking that same stuff and then applying it to you know things that are in our in our 16 designated critical technologies, yeah. right? Yeah. So uh, you know, there's a list of about 20 projects that we've been funded um, in the first two years, and I am yet to add the recent uh, wins uh, to that. So uh, National Science Foundation, National Institute of Health um, are the biggest source of our funding. Uh, they are a collaborative project with a number of industry partners, uh, BMW, Siemens, uh, and quite a few more I have listed in one slide. In people, uh, this is, I need to update this, but uh, Biplo was on the call, and uh, he also does work on ethics and trust in particular, uh, as well as interest in resource uh, issues, for example, water resource management and such. Uh, Forest is uh, working on games uh, and uh, uh, re reinforcement learning and um, uh, uh, Chi has uh, just recently won a new NSF grant on uh, uh, multi-agent systems. Uh, Christian O'Reilly is um, uh, neuroscience at NAI. Uh, so is Vignesh, but he also Vignesh is also in that artist project, and uh, Vignesh uh, works on time series data and many a variety of other things, and also more. Uh, serious issues. Uh, you also uh, saw Amitava who just joined. Um, and then there are uh, a whole number of collaborators that I not even had chance to update this for quite some time. And then many PhD students. And um, again, this is a very um, a half of what we have. Great. There was. Um... And some of them had academic sponsorship or hashtags. Two of them. Two of them. One more. Yeah, number three has all the pictures. That one. Uh, yeah, sure. So I basically says these are already funded. So once they start projects in each of them, I can, you know, and then the pending projects. Uh, so yeah, it's not the sponsors. The DOD is one of the ones that we can't remember. Um, but um, I think project is that the the SSCA one, the the slide detection. Which one? The DOD intelligence is that the reception project? 
Yeah, those are such that's the yeah. exception. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so um, at my previous center, uh, which was uh, about 40 people, uh, we used to get about one third from NSF, one third from NIH, and one third from DOD. Yeah. And any of these projects, are you teaming with any of the HBCUs in the state? Yeah, um, the, uh, even for the, the smart manufacturing project, yeah. uh, the HBCU is part for the workforce development part of that. Which, which HBCU? Uh, uh, I think, um, yeah. We've just signed this week uh, an educational partnership agreement with Benedict. Um, we have one pending with South Carolina State. Um, so Benedict, uh, their technical focus for, for our, from our standpoint is AI, yeah. data science uh, and analytics. We do some interesting things. Uh, for example, I'll be hosting the students coming here uh, uh, for internship uh, on the campus. So they'll be coming by here. Uh, we will probably be offering the summer boot camp um, uh, for high school students, um, uh, a week long, you know, intensive exposure to high school.